Hey, thanks for joining us. My name is Brian Newby, and we are continuing in our series through the book of Proverbs and soon Ecclesiastes. And this is kind of the premise of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about this idea of how do you search for wisdom? And, and what we're believing is that this book, the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and in fact, all of the Bible, all of God's word, has just this incredible practical value and application for our everyday life. And Proverbs actually picks up a whole lot of things for us to think about that we encounter on a daily or weekly or even monthly basis, right? Topics like about our friendships, the relationships that we have and how they, they form our lives or the power of our words, how what we can say can either bring life to people or it can take life from people. It talks about issues from uh, matters of health, our finances, all these different ways that we, we talk about how do we find, what does it look like to search for wisdom? Now, before we jump in too much, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about an experience I had this week, just the everyday life that we live. So we had some friends visiting and, and taking them around town and seeing just some of the different sites. And of course, one of the places that we end up is at Rockefeller. I mean, it's, it's famous, it's from the Gilded Era. There's really amazing architecture. You've got a lot of shows that are still produced there. So, so I find myself here and we're thinking about, looking at all these things about Rockefeller and the name Rockefeller is everywhere. Now, when I did a little bit of research on Rockefeller, because he's such a, an amazing person within the, the history of the city, right? Made a tremendous impact. That Rockefeller was actually one of the first just super wealthy individuals that was in this country. And in fact, at one point, his company uh, had about 90% of the whole share of oil throughout the entire country. I mean, just exerted an incredible amount of influence and also made an incredible amount of money, right? So it, it's maybe not surprising to see these grand buildings with the name Rockefeller on it. In fact, you know that you've made it into a different level of status, right? Whenever you have um, hundreds of women lined up doing can-can routines and like hundreds of Santas going all over every year. Of course, we're talking about the Rockettes if you've ever seen it. Right? All these different ways that, that we say the Rockefellers, wow, they really did some pretty amazing things. Now, one of the most famous quotes from Rockefeller though is actually something that, that's kind of a little sad, but it is indicative of the society and the world that we live in, that the mindset that we tend to carry. Someone came up to uh, Mr. Rockefeller and said, how much is enough? Now, that's actually a, a really good question, right? How much is enough? And I'm not even sure there was much context to the question. How much is enough. Do you know what he said? Just a little bit more. Right? There, there's so many times in life where we go, oh wow, that says a lot, doesn't it? How much is enough? Just, just a little bit more. Right? And when we live in this world where we're always looking for just a little bit more. Right? If you think that's true of somebody who very, very like clearly was one of the wealthiest people in the entire world who had access to everything, right? Influence, prestige, lots of people wanting to be around, wanting to hang on. You can buy whatever it is that you want, and yet you're still at a place where you go, how, how much is enough? When do I ever actually feel like I'm, I'm satisfied? When do you actually feel like you have enough? You know, today, we want to talk about this, and, and I firmly believe that from the book of Proverbs, we want to think through what the Bible has to say, and that if you follow on this path of, of wisdom, if you follow in this, this journey of seeking to live life skillfully as God has set it up to be, that you can actually have what almost no one in New York City has, enough. Today, we want to talk about contentment. What, what is contentment? Kind of how do we enter into that and why can it radically change your life? And I believe that it radically can change your life. When we turn to the book of Proverbs, 
I, I want us to kind of start maybe this discussion from, from this, this angle, right? When we talk about Proverbs, we will look at Proverbs 27, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. It says this, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. Now that those first couple of phrases there, maybe we're not as familiar with, um, you could equate them to kind of uh, death and destruction, right? In a similar way that death is kind of this endless cycle, right? It, it, the, the grave is never satisfied, so the destiny of mankind is ultimately death that to experience this unending cycle of death in that same way that, that it seems like the grave is never satisfied, it's never enough. So too are the eyes of men, women, children, that actually wired into each and every one of us is this, this insatiable craving for more, this thing that goes, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have enough. I need just a little bit more to make me happy. And, and you think, well, is, is this just, Brian, is this just because of social media? Is this, you know, the society that we live in? No, Proverbs is actually clear. This is just kind of how we're wired, right? We're not naturally people who go, wow, I'm just totally content and satisfied with everything in life, and I feel like I can just be at peace, right? Most of us have this kind of inner anxiety that either goes, I need to have more to fill some sort of a satisfaction thing going on in me, or maybe it's driven from a fear. I'm, I'm just, I'm afraid what happens if I don't have enough and so I'm gonna be kind of grasping at things, right? This isn't just a societal pressure. This is actually something that's true of kids, okay? You wanna do an experiment, right? If you have a, a young child in your life, why don't you give them a cookie and then why don't you take two and start eating them in front of them and see what happens, okay? Right? Anybody who's been around kids, we all know exactly what that's going to be, right? You're going to hear, that's not fair, right? And really, at the end of the day, what are we saying? I, I, I can't be happy with one cookie if I know that you have two. I can't enjoy one cookie if I know somebody has more than me, which is crazy because a cookie's going to taste the same if there's only one versus if you have a fistful, right? The idea, the desire for more, to be discontent is actually just wired into our very hearts, okay? And Proverbs is honest about that. Our society lives in this idea that life isn't actually now. Life isn't the cookie that you have in your hand. It's the two that somebody else has in their hands. And, and if you were that person, all of a sudden you'd feel better. All of a sudden you would feel different. You know, another example of this is uh, whenever you're in a relationship, let's say like you're dating or maybe you're going to be getting married soon, everybody lives with this mentality that, right, life is next. Life isn't now, life is next. So, you know, when, when you're dating, oh, well, you know, you guys are kind of starred right now, but, but just wait till, till marriage. And you get married and what happens? Those exact same people go, oh, well, I mean, you're, you're kind of in the honeymoon phase. You, you just wait until the honeymoon phase is done and then you finish the honeymoon phase. And, oh, you're, you don't have kids? Oh, well, well, just wait till you have kids. Oh, they're littles? Wait till they're teens. Oh, you've got kids in the house? And it's just this unending cycle of people going, no, life isn't now. Life is next. It's not the cookie that you have. It's the cookie that somebody else has. And when the problem is when we live in this space where we go, my eyes are never satisfied, my heart is never satisfied, my stomach is never satisfied, right? You, you can live in this grasping reality that at the end of the day, when your life becomes about what is next, and that's where all the value is, that's where your, your heart goes, that's where your mind goes, and you start to fixate on that, that you forget to actually enjoy and live in the life that is now. And at the end of the day, you're not really promised that vacation in six months. You're not really promised that that relationship that suddenly will make life different. You're not actually even promised the very next breath, right? Life is today. And the idea that life is now and not just next is really tied to this idea of contentment. The other way that this is 
spoken of in, in the book of Proverbs. Besides the fact that this is our wiring, we're, we're kind of born as discontent people, that there is a path that you can take to contentment. That you can actually have what almost nobody else has, enough. Look with me at Proverbs 19, verse 23. It says this, The fear of the Lord leads to life. The fear of the Lord leads to life. It, there's a path, there's a journey. And whoever has it, right, what's the it? The fear of the Lord. Whoever has the fear of the Lord, they have rest. And they are satisfied. So the fear of the Lord leads to this, this sort of life that is exemplifying rest and satisfaction. And, and rest can be a hard thing to come by. More and more, people are struggling with sleep. And yes, it may be it's Candy Crush on your phone at that night and the, the lights that now are waking up your brain. <laughs> you know, but for a lot of us, what, what keeps us on those phones? For a lot of us, what keeps us kind of manically checking the news, checking email, is a discontent. Uh, a, a fear of missing out, a fear of not having enough, this unsatisfied thing of I need more, I need to know more. And, and it can rob us from even just something as simple as just a really good night's sleep. The ability to close your eyes and feel satisfied. The Bible says that even though it's our wiring, there is a path to it. And it's called the fear of the Lord. Now, how does that actually work, right? Because it's not just that you go, okay, um, I have the fear of the Lord. And so, snap. Okay, in my life, I, I, I feel content. I feel satisfied. And it doesn't mean I don't work hard. It doesn't mean I don't have goals or I don't hustle. But it does mean this, that, that in the process of that, I can actually feel really good. And I can feel like, yeah, it was, it was a good day. And I feel joy. You don't just snap and all of a sudden you're there. So how does it actually happen, right? It's the fear of the Lord that leads us in this direction. So what is that leading? What's that pathway? I want to tie it up and maybe talk about it from this angle, right? Um, there's a really kind of critical word in the book of Proverbs that I want to introduce to you. You've probably actually heard it before. It's called tov. Now, the Hebrew word tov has kind of a big semantic range. It's another way to say it kind of covers a lot of ground, okay? So we could say, for example, maybe you've heard someone say like Boker tov or Mazel tov or something. And what it often means is kind of like good morning or good day or may, you know, may things be pleasant for you, may things be good for you, kind of as a, as a greeting that we use or a blessing that we hope somebody experiences. The word tov is used over 80 times in your Old Testament, and it, it, it covers this wide range of, I'll say just a couple of the key ones, good, better, uh, and sometimes this idea of pleasure, or you, you experience emotionally, right, a joy um, and a satisfaction from it. And so this idea of good, better, and, and pleasing or, or pleasant is all wrapped up in this book. And in the 80 some times that you're gonna read this throughout the Bible in the Old Testament, almost half of them, almost half of every time that Tov is used, it's actually in this book, the book of Proverbs. Because Proverbs is about this idea of how do you live life with Tov? How do you do it in such a way that, that it's good? that it, it's better because all of us have been in a scenario, right, where we're making choices and you've got different pathways you can take and, and some of those pathways are better than others. And it's not always immediately obvious which one it is. That's why we have to have wisdom. Wisdom, the ability to live life skillfully, starts with this fear of the Lord and then tov, this idea of, how do I know what is actually better? And Tov has to start with trust. So this is why it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom, right? Because to call something good that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise, let's say, for example, you're in an office setting and maybe some people who you're working with are really cranking it out, they're getting ahead, they're getting great reviews, they've got good margins, whatever's going on. 
but they're doing it through an unjust way. Now, you, you have a couple paths that you can go down in that moment, okay? Well, I mean, clearly it's working. And if at the end of the day, the ends justify the means, if that's really our metric for, for what we do and why, then yeah, maybe I, I would feel like it's, hey, why not, you know? It, it, it's good, it's good for me to do that. But then when we hear God's word, then when we come to Proverbs and we read things like how God despises unjust scales, that, that it is better to have less with righteousness than to have more, but you did it through dishonest means. See, now we're at a crossroads and we go, oh, God actually says, this is tov. This is better. And when, we, when we're open to that reality and when we go, I'm willing to accept the idea that, that God created the universe to work in a certain way, that he actually ingrained it with the morality that is in line with his character, when I can accept that, and maybe instead of saying, hey, I'm kind of, you know, the, the, the last one over here and, and poor me for having to do this path, maybe I can actually stop and, and call it Tov. Maybe I can stop and go, okay, let me start with this premise that, that maybe having less, but having less with integrity is actually a good thing. Not, not just a bad thing. You could apply this across the spectrum, you know, right? Whether you're talking your sexuality and what is it, what is good in, in your sexuality? What does good look like in your relationships? What does it mean to be better to live this way than that? It has to start with this acceptance of, this fear of the Lord, a respect for who God is, how he's wired the world to work, and then the willingness to challenge our own mindsets, our own framework of how we see the world and go, I'm going to call good what God calls good to say it's tov. Now, let me read a verse where, where this is maybe comes out in Proverbs 15, seven, okay? This is one of the times that we're gonna hear this word come up in the book of Proverbs over 40 times. Better, or tov, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than with the fattened ox and hatred with it. Now, uh, you know, most of us here aren't, aren't walking around with fattened oxes here, but here's kind of the, the parallel, right? It's better, tov, right? This worldview, this framework that God has set. And he goes, you know, it is better to have a very meager, unsatisfying, unfulfilling meal, right? Because who wants to, you know, have the, uh, the waiter come and, and open up the tray and there's this steam that comes out and this wafting and it's a piece of basil, right? I mean, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not a meal, that's a garnish, okay? That, that's, that's a difference there. Right, and instead of over here, there's this amazing steak, there's this um, incredible meal that's around, this, this feast, okay? And when you look at the two, your gut response is to go, oh, well, I mean, that's obviously better. But with the fear of the Lord, with God's perspective, with the worldview of the Bible, God actually says, no, I want you to know that that herb is actually Tov, it's good. It's actually better because if it's around a table where you've got people who care for you, if it's around a table where you have real relationships, if it's around a table where you can laugh, where you can share stories, where you can, you can put the phone down and actually connect with other human beings in a significant and meaningful way, that is so much better than the opposite of, of maybe you had this completely Instagram worthy meal that, that you can snap, but then there's that cold chill in the room, that silence only broken up by the cutlery sawing back and forth, to eat that really expensive steak, to have that really expensive experience. If it's surrounded by people who really don't care about you, or maybe they're even kind of against you. What's actually better in life, right? All the decisions that we have to make, all the things that we have to do, what does it mean to be making choices that are better, that are good? 
So it has to start with this idea. Okay, let's use this, this proverb as an example. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is. Here, here's an example of maybe how we would go through this process, how we walk down the path of the fear of the Lord to get to the destination of rest and satisfaction. If we use it as a test case, okay? Um, if I can say, I look at this amazing feast, I look at this little sprig, this garnish, you know, a little like spray of cilantro thrown on the plate there. And I'm willing to challenge my own worldview. I'm willing to challenge maybe my own stomach, okay? Um, I'm willing to, to challenge uh, my olfactory senses, right? What smells better, what looks better, what, I, what have I been told is better? I'm willing to go, okay, I'm willing to say, this is good. Because, because God called it good. And even though, boy, I really kind of wish I could just package it all together and have it all, and what if I had everything over here? But, but I'm willing to say, hey, what I have here is actually, it's not bad, it's actually good. And then we meditate on it and say, you know what, maybe it's not just better than bad, it's good. What if we actually say, you know what, I can, I can meditate on and embrace and start to believe in the wisdom of it and go, this is actually better. This is a better way to set up life. And, and go, you know what? If I were just picking, I really do want to pick real relationships around less. Real with less over fake with more. And, and it's not just not bad. It's actually better than that. And when we can wrap our heads around how this is wise, how this is better, how, man, how God designed it actually makes, a, makes more sense, then in that place, you find a satisfaction. You find a sort of ability to go when at first that, that little tray was lifted and all the, the smoke comes out and it's, you know, a sprig of rosemary, okay? <laughs> That initial disappointment, that dissatisfaction, when you see it in the context of how, how God is framing life and where you can go, hey, I don't, I don't know exactly why I'm, I'm only getting this, but I can see it's good, I can see it's better, and in that place, in that moment, I can actually experience contentment. Now, you know, most of us are not going to face the decision today about whether I'm going to be, you know, eating some chives by themselves or whether I'm going to be having this amazing meal. And, and Proverbs actually isn't that concerned about herbs versus steak. Although, what it is concerned about is there's so many things in our lives, right? I, I don't know what your herbs are, but there's so many things in life where, where kind of the lid is lifted off and, and the smoke clears and we're looking at our relationships, we're looking at our finances, our bank statements, we're looking at the sort of, you know, life that we're living, the vacations that we have, and, and we're looking at everybody else's Instagram filters and going, I, I, I need more to be happy. I, I can't be happy with this because life isn't now, life is actually next. I don't know what your, what your herb dinner is, but you know what? You can actually have what almost nobody has, enough, a contentment. And a contentment that is based off the fear of the Lord. Yeah, God, I, I recognize you've set the world up to work in a certain way and you've called this good. And I want to wrap my head and heart around that and believe that it's better. And when I can do that, then I can actually experience this sort of joy, this sort of peace, and this sort of rest. And you know what wisdom looks like? Wisdom looks like kind of recognizing Maybe it just starts there, recognizing when that, when that plate lifts and the, the smoke clears and you're looking at a tray of disappointment. To stop and go, what, is, what does God say is tov? What does God say is better in this moment? And, and if it is in fact better, if, if this is a place where, where you can call it good and, and you can say, I understand that this is better, then you know what? you can actually sit down and enjoy the cookie that you have in your hand and not have it shoving it down and not even thinking it or being present because you're just fixated on the person over there who has two. Contentment. 
it's really hard to come by. And it has to start with the fear of the Lord, with this idea of Tov. Now, let's close in our, our story of uh, Mr. Rockefeller, okay? It's unfortunate that uh, his most famous quote is one about being discontent. And you know what? That whole idea of more, when is enough enough, and you're the, one of the wealthiest people in the entire globe, and yet you can't stop and you're thinking it's gonna be just the next step and at the end of the day, you look down, you find out you're just on a treadmill. You're not actually covering ground, right? Satisfaction isn't just around the corner when life is always next. And so he kind of looked down and saw the treadmill. And how we would say it today was um, he found himself at the height of his career with an incredible mental and emotional and physical breakdown. His body was physically breaking down. He was unable to sleep, he lost all of his hair, and I don't even know how, why this is medically true, but he actually lost all of his eyebrows. I mean, his body was shutting down for the incredible amounts of, of discontentment and this underlying anxiety that was in him, that the, the rat race to always get more, to find the next and to improve and to be better, and the, the hustle was killing him. You know, one of the most amazing things about Rockefeller, it, that he amassed so much money that he changed how we thought about business, an incredible um, story. But you know maybe the most incredible feat was he went from a man who said, when is it enough, just, just a little bit more, that he actually journeyed down the path of wisdom and that he actually started to frame things from a different view about what it meant to have enough, what it, what it meant to live a life that was worthwhile. And he found enough. And you know, it wasn't in one more dollar going into his pocket. It wasn't in one more accomplishment as a business. He actually found it in giving things away. He was a very dedicated Christian, went to church all the time, um, a Baptist. And when he shifted his life to go, how do I frame it to not be how much I can bring in, but how can I give things away? How can I, I live in this generosity? His life started to change. And actually, Rockefeller became known for a lot more than just the Rockettes, right? He became known as one of the most amazing uh, philanthropists of his time, gave away an incredible sum of money to schools, to churches, um, University of Chicago, a lot of things that we have plastered all around this city with his name for a man who found enough. I don't know where you are today and I don't, I don't know what your plate of herbs or the disappointments that you find in life or the, the treadmill that you find yourself on, but today I want you to know that because of the fear of the Lord, because of embracing this idea of Tov, there, there's a better way to live. I can find enough. You can find enough. And you can have an incredible amount of contentment in your life as it is now, not as you wish it would be tomorrow. May you have enough this week.